Okay, let me lay out a scenario for you. You have a pure deposit of iron ore. In the earliest stages of the game, the most you can yield from that deposit is 120 ore per minute with a Mark 1 miner. That iron then has to be processed through a smelter in order to produce iron ingots. Each smelter can produce at maximum 30 ingots per minute whilst having an input of 30 ore per minute, basically one to one. But you have to keep in mind that you're mining 120 ore per minute. So in that case, only having one smelter is inefficient and necessitates four smelters in order to get a proper one to one ratio on ore mined to ingots produced per minute. Easy enough. But now you have two basic iron parts that need to be produced from those freshly pressed and processed iron ingots. Iron plates, which need 30 ingots per minute, which is perfect since your smelters are already making 30 ingots per minute and therefore you can create one constructor per smelter to maintain one to one production. But you also have to make iron rods, which only need 15 ingots per minute. Okay, no problem. Two constructors per smelter and bam, we still have 100% efficiency. Uh, oh, what's that? We need iron rods to make screws? Okay, no problem. How many rods do we need to make screws? Wait, 10? 10 rods per minute? But, no, but I'm making 15 per minute. So what, I'm just going to have five left over? Where do the other five go? Well, that's not going to be 100% fit. Who the fuck brought an algebra quiz to my video game? What I just described is one of the more basic examples of problem solving in Satisfactory. What's Satisfactory? Well, Satisfactory is a first-person factory building and automation game developed by the Swedish-based studio Coffee Stain, most well known for their 2014 high art masterpiece, Goat Simulator. In Satisfactory, you play as a lone pioneer employed by the fictional Fixit Inc. sent down to an alien planet where your main objective is to mine the planet in order to create machines that then create parts that are then sent up a real thick boy of a structure to a mysterious corporation that from my experience, doesn't seem to give a two cent shit about your health and safety. Riveted? Well, don't feel bad. I wasn't exactly sticking to my seat when my friends pitched it to me either, but that's what really inspired this video because despite how monotonous or boring this game may seem in concept, it is without a doubt one of the most well-designed and masterfully crafted experiences I've had the pleasure of playing through my near 30 years of gaming and I wanted to share why that is. Right off the bat, Satisfactory is lush with its style and presentation. Your first introduction has you strapped into an orbital drop pod, only able to look around. An unassuming chime indicates the start of a pre-recorded message that is narrated by this robotic-like female voice similar to that of Gladys and Portal, which funnily enough is a direct inspiration that was cited to me by a Q&A I had with one of the community managers. You're then inaugurated into your role as a pioneer, working for the Fixit Incorporated. In just under 60 seconds, the entire objective of the game is laid out in front of you. Construct machines for mining, explore and exploit the planet for its resources, and automate the whole process as quickly as possible. As well as reporting back any new discoveries to be analyzed by research and development. All done through a very cheeky, animated demonstration akin to the short Pip-Boy videos from the Fallout series. The video ends and the descent begins. Through a tiny window on the front of the pod's door, the flames of the atmosphere burn against the heat shielding of the pod and the darkness of space begins to fade away and the pale blue of the planet's sky fades in. The pod shakes and creaks with a faint alarm buzzing in the background clashing against an increasing swell from the game's pleasantly ominous soundtrack. The pod stabilizes as thrusters push you back against the planet's gravity, the clouds part from the viewport, and you see it. The strange, alien planet you're going to be spending your time on. Now, this next connection wasn't specifically inspired by this, but to me, it felt very reminiscent of cresting that underwater mountain in Bioshock and revealing Rapture for the very first time. I plan to speak more about this later, but while I'm here, I can't help but touch on the incredibly satisfying and almost tactile-like quality to the game's sound design. Like I mentioned with the atmospheric entry phase, Satisfactory provides a considerable amount of meaningful audio to everything the player does and interacts with. Down to the thunk on the pods smashing against the planet's surface into the grinding of the door's levers, which despite not being something you as a player control the movement of, still feels chunky and lumbering to watch being operated. 
followed by the depressurization of the pod against the atmosphere, it's such an engrossing and enchanting experience. And there it is. After only 2 minutes and 30 seconds, the game sets you loose on your own to venture out into the world and start amassing resources. It should be noted that this intro sequence is optional and can be skipped entirely if you choose to start a new game. So instead of going through the rigors of setting up and uh, upgrading the hub each time, you can begin a brand new build already on tier 1, and you're off to the races. But back to your first playthrough, however, you're given a box of materials that are then used to create the hub, the central base of operations which you as the player will find yourself interacting with throughout the game. It provides you with a crafting bench to hand make items, two biomass burners which will help power some of your machines in the early game, and a terminal which will be used to submit set numbers of materials that will then unlock new tiers or milestones which will provide new items, machines, and equipment. The main core of the progression in Satisfactory is funneled through this terminal and is something that I'll explore later, but for now, I'd like to touch on how the early game works. Speaking again with one of the community managers, the topic of balance was brought up, particularly early game and how difficult something like this was to balance. Something that I noted after starting a game, getting so far into it, learning new ways to do things, and creating a new one was the dichotomy between handcrafting items or streamlining automation. Like previously mentioned, one of your main directives is automation, yet one of the first things you have to do as a new player is to mine, refine, and create all of your raw materials by hand. So within the span of 5 to 10 minutes, you're being told to do one thing and then forced to do something that completely contradicts those directions. This isn't an accident. This was deliberate, and it's a phenomenal example of how to prime your players as a game developer. Behind the facade of a game that's centered around construction and automation, parallels those objectives with a world full of potential, like a blank canvas for creative and imaginative people to manipulate to their heart's content. This subtle act of priming makes the players either consciously or subconsciously aware that like the proverbial cat, there is more than one way to skin this thing. Something Satisfactory does in such a way that allows you to figure it out on your own, respecting your intelligence as a player while not burying it so deep within the nuance of the game's systems that only experienced players will discover. This to me is not only one of the greatest design decisions within the game, but a great example of design philosophy when it comes to making games providing agency over the process and completion of tasks. Naturally, the most efficient way of creating items within Satisfactory is to establish production lines that create those items for you autonomously. Yet, there will be times in which setting up that new line of production would in fact take longer to complete than it would be to just craft a handful of those things manually. Typically where this method takes preference over the other would be in those instances where you're short a couple of units in order to complete a milestone or construct a new building. Where this trade-off begins to rear its shortcomings, however, is through the game's progression and necessity for mass creation of those items. Again, the majority of the items in Satisfactory can be crafted by hand, but in doing so you limit the potential of what the game is intended to be and artificially create a less than ideal amount of tedium which can bring your enjoyment and progression to a screeching halt. Despite not having an economy in the game, with the exception of the Awesome Store, which you earn tickets by feeding all of your extra goodies into the Awesome Sink, the game forces a different kind of economy on its players. The economy of time. Sure, things cost materials to make other things, but more than the value of those things in relation to one another is the value each thing takes to construct based on the time it takes to construct it. This is exemplified through both the amount of time it takes a machine to construct it as well as how long it takes to construct these items by hand at the workbench. Back to the early game and how it acclimates and teaches new players how to play, the disembodied voice of the game's AI, Ada, does a great job of providing adequate information about how things work without overwhelming the players. Her blurbs about newly acquired resources or constructibles either provide a basic overview of the item or, in the case of upgrading an existing item, provides information that scaffolds off the knowledge of the previous iteration. Again, I cannot help but praise Coffee Stain on their design philosophy in regards to how they approach game progression and player information. Everything is pieced out in such a way that being able to keep up with what's going on never feels as daunting or overwhelming as it could. With that in mind, they also knew that the game needed to have information not just be available, but accessible as well. Things like the in-game notification and resource log which gives detailed breakdowns of all the things that you have unlocked and access to as well as the baked-in search function that also doubles as a calculator. So if you're ever forced into a debate with your math teacher ever again about life and its lack of readily available calculators, 
Tell them I said they can suck it because Satisfactory has your back. And trust me, the deeper you get, the more that thing becomes relevant into your gameplay. Being that this is an open world game, there are plenty of similarities between this and other open world games, but several deviations that set Satisfactory apart. For starters, there are no quest markers of any kind. The most you'll find in the way of telling you where to go is done through the pings on the compass when scanning for mineral deposits. I found this to be easily one of the most refreshing aspects of Satisfactory because it further deepens the idea that the game is yours to be played however you see fit. Like I said before, there is no one way to do something in this game in terms of how you approach a particular problem or objective. By this point, you've already learned about your resource scanner and now have to make the decision about which direction you choose to go. This also begins a trend in which your previous decisions immediately begin to impact your future decisions. Based on where you decide to erect your hub, you may or may not be close to other available or necessary resources, something you will constantly be evaluating the further you progress through the game upon the discovery of newer resources. Once you've gone through the process of upgrading the essential parts of your hub, a process which acts as the game's tutorial, you're now ready to begin the game in earnest. In a way, Satisfactory also acts in ways that are akin to puzzle games. The puzzle being not only how you set up your factory, but where and how effective those choices lead to a desired outcome. More than likely, your first time playing Satisfactory will result in a streamlined, tunneled vision-like approach to automation. Remember that rant at the beginning of the video about parts per minute and production efficiencies? Yeah, that's a concept that may or may not come to most players right away. Instead, the most common approach seems to be to create one thing that leads into one thing that leads into another thing. So instead of looking at how many parts per minute something is making, you're only concerned with simply producing a finished product from raw materials, resulting in a single miner into a single smelter into a single constructor. That sort of thing might seem trivial at the time, but it's a single breadcrumb of a larger loaf of information meant to subliminally teach you about bottlenecks, overflow, and production. Now, I can't confirm what I'm about to say next, but it feels too intentional not to be the case, so while I'm going to be pulling this out of my ass, just know that it's being done with a lot of educated thoughts and assumptions. Now, Satisfactory purposefully goes out of its way to subvert your ideas about problem solving in video games. Let's use Portal as an example. In the first Portal test chambers 1 through 18 are designed to teach you about all the mechanics the game has to offer, culminating in test chamber 19 and the subsequent sections after meant to challenge your knowledge of all those mechanics to be used in tandem in order to complete the game. Satisfactory, on the other hand, while doing things similar, also twists your knowledge of systems and mechanics, forcing you to approach and solve problems laterally instead of vertically. Let me try and explain what I mean. A parallel between Satisfactory and Portal and their approach to problem solving can be best illustrated with the Companion Cube level. In Satisfactory, you're given tools, i.e. the Portal's Companion Cube, to create products, i.e. solve the test chamber. We know what these tools and materials can do because we've used them and seen them used in basic and familiar ways. Now imagine if at the end of Portal, you're given another companion cube exactly like the one in Test Chamber 17, but now the cube can make portals of its own and shoot the rockets needed to defeat Gladys. That's how Satisfactory feels. While everything you're given and taught builds upon itself, it also never stops forcing you to rethink how it's being used challenging almost every decision you've made and creating problems where they didn't exist previously. This is made even more apparent by the inclusion of alternate recipes, which I'll discuss more in the open world and exploration portion of the video, but for now, I want to address how the problem solving lends itself to both organic and manufactured solutions to said problems. Let's start by looking at power. In order for your machines to function, they need electricity. Despite all the future tech available to you, you're still on an alien planet without an established electrical grid of any kind, so you'll have to start from the bottom with the most basic materials. The first thing you're given are two biomass burners attached to the rear of your hub. Each of these burners are capable of generating 30 megawatts of power. For reference, a Mark I miner needs 5 megawatts of power, a smelter needs 4, and a constructor needs 4 as well. They may not seem like a lot, but it certainly adds up quickly. But the real kicker here isn't necessarily focused on how much power you'll need, but how often you'll need it. You see, when you build multiple biomass burners in order to conjure up the necessary power needed to run your machines, each one of them will need to be filled with materials capable of being burned as fuel. The most basic of which being sticks and leaves, which can be gathered by walking around the world and picking them up. Now because this is satisfactory, this isn't the only source or version of this fuel. 
Should you feel inclined, however, you can take the sticks and leaves you've collected and construct them into biomass at a workbench by hand. The biomass has a much better fuel efficiency and will take longer to burn, resulting in power for much longer versus the raw sticks and leaves. What's that? Sounds like a huge pain in the ass? Well, kinda, but I can assure you that it's supposed to. And that's okay because once you've unlocked storage units from the organization milestone, you can automate biomass production for your factory. By placing copious amounts of leaves into a storage container, you can then send them to a constructor to make the biomass for you. Now all you have to do is refill the burners once they run out. Oh, I'm sorry. That still sounds shitty and tedious? Okay, no problem. Let's just unlock the clear cutting milestone, which gives us access to a chainsaw and solid biofuel. Now we have the means to collect leaves and wood in mass, while simultaneously providing yet another alternative fuel source, which will then burn even slower and provide an even better fuel efficiency. So now that I've completely sold how awesome all of this is, let's discuss why this is designed this way and why it's not nearly as bad as it sounds. Yes, babysitting your power grid in the early game isn't fun or exciting, but it isn't supposed to be. It's built this way to encourage progression. Again, what Satisfactory excels at is teaching the players lessons through mechanics and problems. Likely the first thing you'll run into is power consumption and how easy it is to exceed it, which will then prompt the need for more burners. So now, instead of expanding your factory and focusing on the tasks and milestones, you have to derail your progress in order to get everything back on track. This isn't meant to impede you necessarily, but rather to balance progression in a way that feels natural which simultaneously drives the desire for self-sustaining power of some kind, nudging you in the direction of progression in order to obtain said power. Thankfully, this comes once you've obtained coal power in the third tier, but as the famed philosopher once said, mo money, mo problems. By now you're into the meat of the game and you have begun to see the fruits of your labor. You've likely gotten a modest but productive chain of facilities crafting all of your basic parts and necessities. With the exception of running out of or exceeding your power usage, your facilities, if set up correctly, are now able to operate on their own. Thus it's time to leave the nest and explore the planet for additional resources. Now, it should be noted that the game can be explored at any time should you feel inclined to do so, but I'd be lying if I said it was advised. Because your means of defense and mobility are so limited in the early game, it creates an organic limitation on you as a player that almost discourages exploration without feeling like you're being told not to. More than likely, you've been too busy building up your factories to really even consider doing so, and in turn, the game sort of allows you to limit yourself based on your needs at the time. Unlike other games which have tiered unlocks and progression, Satisfactory rarely limits the places you can go. Sure, you may not be able to reach certain heights due to a lack of materials, but that boils down to the limitations to your capacity to get there, not the game telling you you can't. The only exception being areas encased in toxic gas or irradiated uranium deposits which kill you quickly over a short period of time. Places which later become accessible once you've unlocked the means to protect yourself. Otherwise, the planet is yours to explore, but like I said, it isn't immediately encouraged. As you've likely already encountered, there are hostile creatures on the planet, typically in areas where there are resource nodes or power slugs. Most of these creatures, while still deadly, vary in degrees of threat level. Things like the fluffy-tailed hogs, spitters, and flying crab hatchers can decently be handled with just the Xenozapper, which is nice since they are the primary enemies you'll encounter on the planet. That said, there are other creatures such as the Alpha Hogs and the Red and Green Alpha Spitters which typically protect higher valued areas such as pure resource deposits, drop pods, or the yet to be implemented Sommer Sloops and Mercer Spheres. These can still be killed with the Xeno Zapper however, but it's exponentially more difficult as they have higher damage thresholds and output more damage themselves. And then there's the Stingers. Those hell spawn spider-like abominations conceived in Satan's anus designed to drain the bladder and bowels of all they encounter. I don't know who's responsible for the creation of these things, but I want to take this opportunity to address them for a moment if I may. <clears throat> now, uh, don't take what I'm going to say personally because I love and respect all that you and the other developers have put into the game, but fuck you in particular. I've played my fair share of horror games and have plenty of other games stress me out or get my heart racing, but nothing, nothing compares to the unabated fear and terror those things incite. Unironically, the game even features an arachnophobia mode because of these fucking things, which doesn't make them any less deadly but instead replaces their character models with a sprite of a cat and the ass puckering skittering noises they make into adorable meows. That should give you an idea of how horrid these things are. Okay. 
Sorry for the rant, but it needed to be said. Alright, back to the game and the other shit that it does well and stuff. This is how Satisfactory curbs the exploration in organic and meaningful ways. Again, the game doesn't tell you you can't go anywhere, but once you've wandered off into a fight you weren't prepared for, you'll quickly realize how unequipped you are to properly defend yourself. This is similar to how Fallout New Vegas did with its players. When you leave Good Springs at the start of the game, you can walk yourself right into an area littered with death claws, hinting to the player that while yes, you can technically go here, you're going to have a bad time doing so. It also keeps the player progressing through the milestones that are laid out for them instead of just dipping out to hike about the planet. By far one of the more interesting creatures, if you could call them that, are the power slugs. They serve a pretty incredible role in the automation aspect of the game. After finding and researching these things, you learn the ability to overclock and underclock your machines, which at first sounds like a no-brainer, which would be better to do so. More power means you'll make things more quickly. But just like everything else at this point, there's a trade-off. That being the significant increase in power consumption for any machine that you choose to overclock. The flip side though being that in cases where you might be overproducing or perhaps don't necessitate things to be made at 100% capacity, you can choose to underclock your machines, which again, reduces power consumption and in a lot of cases provides a better load balance of materials to other machines and flattens the curve of overall power consumption in the process. All these design decisions work in tandem with each other perfectly in the early game. You can't leave your factory because it will inevitably run out of power and even if you did, you're substantially ill-equipped to deal with the threats of the world. It's a beautifully ingenious amalgamation of players' desires encouraging and necessitating progression, all done without being told you have to, but rather, you want to in order to facilitate the other things you want to do. To explore this beautiful and strange planet for its resources and its secrets, which brings me to exploration and its impact on the game. The open world of Satisfactory is not procedurally generated but is instead built and crafted specifically to function the way that it is. Every rock, tree, resource, or slug has been placed by design and intent. You may be wondering if something like this would be detrimental to the overall experience of the game, and I don't believe that it does. I'm sure arguments could be made that an ever-changing map might be beneficial to replayability, but my response to that would be that what you would gain in a single area of preference you lose in the intentionality of everything else the game builds upon. I know personally, I've become quite jaded over the years with many games that feel this need to be an open world. Trying to build and fill a place with things to do, but ultimately just results in boring landscapes and superfluous checkbox collectathons. This to me is what makes the open world of Satisfactory so refreshing and unique. They don't let a single part of the chicken go to waste here. With the obvious exception of the aforementioned items that are currently still works in progress, everything else has a purpose and every new discovery or acquisition feels meaningful and substantial in some way. Something that, while I'm playing, I tend to get lost in and forget that I'm playing a budgeted early access game by an ostensibly independent studio. Rarely do I feel the sense of wonder and excitement wandering around in open world games. Mostly because for the majority of them, the world, while expansive, doesn't feel substantive or worth my time to explore. Other than the milestones you work towards and achieve through the hub, you have a secondary set of goals or objectives you can undertake as well. This being the MAM, or Molecular Analysis Machine. The purpose of this machine is to decode and research all the items that you find throughout the world that are not part of the tiered milestones in the hub. This ranges from consumable plants all the way to other types of minerals and resources that can then be used by other parts of your production. I should mention that these secondary objectives are optional, but only to an extent. Because each thing you find has multiple applications, working your way through each one of these things through the progression tree within the MAM unlocks further uses of said things. But that doesn't mean each tier has to be researched in order to progress. Plenty of the unlocks are optional or merely aid to assist the players, but there are currently some such as Quartz and Caterium that will need to be researched in order to produce a handful of the goods or objects for later stages of the game, as if to work in tandem to the major production tiers imposed on you through the hub's terminal progression system. What's most interesting to me about this is that you can actually access a lot of these things earlier than is necessitated for progress. Things like Quartz and Caterium can be found and utilized in the process of unlocking items or materials that don't actually become relevant for some time. One of the biggest and potentially game-changing aspects of the MAM and its research abilities is that of decoding recovered hard drives from previously crashed drop pods. What makes these so substantial is their ability to vastly impact how you construct your factories and produce items within them. 
On each one of these hard drives, for which there are 96 as of writing this video, they provide alternate recipes for production, with the exception of two which unlock additional inventory space for the player. Once a hard drive has been unlocked, you are given the option between three alternative recipes to choose from. The most difficult part, however, is that not all alternative recipes would be considered resource efficient, meaning they actually require more resources or require a factory layout that may prove more difficult than that of standard recipes provided. I'd be lying if I said I haven't looked up each of these recipes every time I was presented with this choice because I don't want to make things harder on myself. The game only provides the information. It doesn't tell you which is better or what is worse, but rather leaves it up to you to decide. Seeing that the game centers around this vast sense of creative freedom, I can really appreciate this approach as it further emphasizes the idea that the player has agency and control, allowing you to feel like the factory and the decisions you make about it are yours. Even when you feel like you have to do things a certain way, the game constantly reminds you that you have options and it doesn't want you to feel like you're stuck doing things the way it wants you to. So by now I've gone over how the game works, some of its systems, and how they impact the game, but that still doesn't quite address what makes it so special. How is it that a factory and automation game can consume one's life to the point that they spend not only hundreds of hours playing it, but another couple dozen hours making a video about it? What I believe makes Satisfactory so special is the culmination of all the things I've been talking about. Before starting this project, I had never played the game Factorio, a game that helped to inspire Satisfactory as well as get a lot of people into the idea of what a factory and automation game looked like. I took it on a recommendation from a friend to spend some time with the game in order to provide both some perspective and context to the genre. In doing so, I was a bit surprised by my experience, being that I had already understood the core concept of the game and knew what I was doing, I found myself feeling a bit lost and uninterested before eventually putting the game down and coming back to Satisfactory. While the two games are ostensibly the same as far as player motives and mechanics, the biggest and most obvious difference is the perspective. Factorio takes place from a third-person, isometric, top-down viewpoint while Satisfactory is in the first person. Now, I'm not one that limits immersion or enjoyability to a title based on perspective, but what I can say in regards to the two games is that I personally felt more invested and connected to my experience in Satisfactory because of its first-person perspective. As I discussed with the opening moments of the game, it was immediately apparent that I would be building these factories and exploring this world as opposed to moving an avatar on screen to do my bidding. Contrast that to the opening moments of Factorio and there's a lot less fanfare or presentation provided to the players about the experience that they were going to have. Not to mention the connectivity I had to things I was doing which brings me to my next point about some particular details that may or may not connect with you the way they did with me. In one of the developer Q&As on Coffee Stain's YouTube channel, the user interface slash user experience lead Natalie brought up something that I had never really considered before. Obviously, we know when a game has a good or a bad UI, and that becomes even more apparent when a game like Satisfactory is going to have you looking at it constantly, but what stood out to me the most is when she talked about how things should feel. Not just navigating them, but executing them. Things like how a button should sound or feel when you press it. Does it have weight? Is it satisfying for the player to do? Even when it seems inconsequential, it further brought to light how much consideration has been taken for even the smallest things in this game. That's the secret sauce to Satisfactory. It's truly realizing that everything, no matter how big or small, has been built, looked at, reworked, tested, analyzed, and implemented by the dev team. Despite this being an early access game, other than a few minor graphical glitches, it feels like this was given the same amount of love and attention you'd expect from a studio like, say, Rockstar or Naughty Dog. It's not hyperbole or attempting to make a pun when I say how satisfactory doing things are in Satisfactory. Placing down a building or connecting a conveyor belt has so many audio and visual ticks that makes every action feel like it has life to it. Loading up items into the space elevator and sending off the payload chunks and thunks as it's being jettisoned off into space. Flipping switches or levers feels weighty and sounds mechanically tactile. It's no secret by now that I'm completely enamored by this game and everything it does. Despite it appearing boring or tedious, I can assure you that Coffee Stain has gone out of their way to provide an experience that's equal parts creatively freeing and substantive. That's why I wanted to make this video more than anything. 
not just to spend however long this ended up being filleting the developers, but to highlight what outstanding game design looks like. How a game shouldn't just have things for the sake of having them. How some games like Cyberpunk or Ghost Recon Wildlands, despite being open world games, feel shallow and empty. Feeling like they would have been better served as if they were built out more like Hitman in 2016 where the player was provided with detailed and living sandboxes for the rest of the game's systems to be better highlighted and utilized. That a game doesn't need to be a multi-million dollar property or franchise to be given the love and attention it needs to be great. Satisfactory excels at giving the player a fun and substantial experience because it made sure that everything the player would be doing wasn't a waste of time. That even when the game threw you a curveball, it did so in order to challenge you, but not just for the sake of challenge, but to provide more substance for things to come. The fact that the game is just about to release its .5 update is baffling to me, basically informing us that this game is just halfway into its finished production. That things like narrative haven't even been addressed or implemented yet still manages to retain my attention and excitement, and it says a lot about how well designed this game is. And that's where I'm going to leave this for now. Perhaps I'll come back and do more analysis after the full release of the game. I know it's something I wrestled with when deciding to even make this video, but I knew that there was enough here to discuss that it didn't matter if the game was finished or not. If I had to try and sum up why this game is worth your time, I still don't think that I could give a good enough bite-sized pitch, but what I will say is that once you play it, you'll understand how well it takes something that seems boring feel, well, satisfactory. Thanks for watching.